of our country over this past year because of all that's happened, because of the deception, the challenges in the election, what's going on with the China virus, what has happened on June, uh, January the 6th, what happened in the riots last summer, the lies that are being propagated. It's a tough time. And you know what it has brought forth in so many people is a sense of dread, of worry, of fear. In my years, I was ordained in 1975, and all the years I've seen a lot of stuff go on. I have never seen as much dread, worry, fear, trepidation, aggravation. People aggravated about all of it and depressed. So I want to tell you today on this 4th of July, we don't need to come under that cloud of heaviness. And I want to just give you a simple word from the Word of God today about how worry and dread no longer has to be in your head. Here's the truth, y'all. Worry is like a rocking chair. You do a whole lot of movement, but you don't go anywhere. It just holds you at bay. He was a baseball player a number of years ago. Some of you might remember him with the Texas Rangers, Mickey Rivers, kind of an old country guy. And he said this. I thought it was really good. I wrote it down. He says, ain't no sense in worrying about things you ain't got no control over because if you ain't got no control over them, well, there ain't no sense in worrying. I thought that was a glorious piece of wisdom right there because the dictionary says that worry is apprehension over what might happen. I'm losing my peace over what might happen, what situations may come upon us, what things may transpire that we don't know. A precious woman that Jill and I were around a lot when we were in R. Roberts University was Corey Tenboom. Y'all remember her movie, The Hiding Place? Corey was a precious, precious woman, gone on to glory now. But she said so many pithy little comments. And here was one she said. She said, worry is like an old man with bended head, carrying a load of feathers he thinks is lead. That's what worry is. And here's what the King James says. It says, take no thought. Be careful what you think. But get this from the Greek. It means this. Worry means a divided mind. That you're divided in the sense that you are putting faith in something that may happen but has not yet transpired. It is a form of meditation. You're meditating on the issues that you think are going to come to pass, but you're allowing them to immobilize you for two reasons. The future is not here. If I'm fo focused totally on the future, I'm ruining my today. And secondly, the future is not for you to determine. Oh, are your choices important? You better believe they are. I am the day, and you are much of the sum of your choices. But we didn't determine the future of the COVID. We didn't determine the future of what the Chinese would do. We didn't determine the future that we are looking at in so many instances that we could not control. So since the future is not here, and the future is not mine to determine, I must look back at a living God and say, I trust you. Worry is trying to take control over something that you can't control. I'm trying to bring a control to the future, thinking that my worry is going to do me good. Oh, how many times did my grandmother say, oh, honey, I love you so much, I just worry about you all the time. And you know what? I said, well, Granny, are you going to give me 50 bucks? I mean, you know, <laughs> you know are you going to help me out? Of, no, baby, I don't know about that, but I just love you so much, and I just worry about you, sweetheart. Jesus said in this famous section we'll look at right now, five times within just eight or so verses, take no thought, take no thought, which is the translation in modern translations, don't worry, don't have thoughts of worry. Don't let thoughts of worry start to take you because they are not giving you an accurate indication. Let's look over in Matthew 6, verse 25. Matthew 6, 25. You know this portion of Scripture extremely well. Matthew 6, 25. It says, 
Therefore I say unto you, again this is the old King James, take no thought or don't worry about your life. What you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you will put on. You know, think about Owen's testimony. In the middle of that, not being able to get off the floor for two and a half days, he had no option but to just put all his trust, all his hope, all his dependence in the mighty God. He didn't know how that would work. But you know, in the place he was in, would worry have done him any good? Would depression have done him any good? Would disappointment have done him any good? No. Not that he didn't experience those things, but the only thing that would have done him any good in that moment is to know the Lord is on my side. I shall not fear. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no for thou art thy rod and thy staff they, you bet. That's what I would have been quoting down on that floor. Because he was trusting God. So where does worry get us? What well, Jesus says right there, is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Here's his point. He is saying, if I created you, if I made something so great, so awesome, so ponderous as the human body, would I not then also take care of feeding that body, clothing that body, covering that body, giving shelter for that body? You mean I would make such a glorious creation and then not have those things that would keep it in operation? Of course not. So he's going here, literally in this part, from the greater to the lesser. He's saying, we're the greater, and so if I have done those things for you, would I not then also consistently and purposely provide for you? Does that mean you just stand there and God's going to put money in your hands? No, he is going to give you by wisdom, by the gifts of the Spirit, to show you even in hard times how he will take care of you. Wasn't Owen's thing a hard time? But did God not take care of him? Why? Because the Lord was on his side. He did not have to fear. Now, what I'm going to say to you today is all with the letter I. I have a lot of things where I'll give you the letter B or the letter D. This is a different one today. All these things I will give you from the sixth chapter of Matthew are the letter I. And so this first one today is the letter or the word inconsistent. It would be inconsistent for God to make you and not provide for you. He wouldn't do it. He would be a God coming up short. So our first letter is I. Then the second one, look at verse 26. Let's go on. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Here we go. Are you not much better than they? So here's what I would put on there. The I, it's irrational. Before we were going from the greater us as people to the lesser our provisions, now he turns it the other way. He goes from lesser, the fowls of the air, to greater us. And he says, isn't it irrational to think that all those birds up there, all the crows, all the eagles, all the turkeys I used to love go to shoot in the spring, all those birds I take care of are you not more valuable than them here's the lie that happens with worry we believe in that moment that God is still not fully concerned about our needs and he doesn't care that's exactly what the enemy wants you to think because that blocks your hope and what happens when your hope is blocked hope blocks faith because faith is the substance of things hoped for without hope you have no vision when you stay in worry, when you stay in dread, when you stay in guilt, when you stay in condemnation, all those things harden your heart. Out of the heart, man believes. If I allow my heart to get hardened because I'm scared I'm going to get COVID, I'm scared that the shot's going to take me down, I'm scared that the Chinese are going to blow us off the, the map. A lot of people think that today the Chinese are going to do something. Well, okay, they do, they do. But I'm going to go ahead and hear these folks up in Nashville at 4 o'clock and get encouraged in the Lord. <laughs> you see, I can't change these things. It doesn't mean that I'm not concerned. Now, let me give you this. 
Jesus is not saying in these passages that don't plan. He's not saying that you're not concerned. But you know what? There is a fine line from planning well and then in your planning getting overwhelmed with worry. Here's, here's my experience. I'll let worry hit me. My planning is lousy. There's a difference between worry and concern. Now, here's the way I see it. Worry always looks at tomorrow. Oh, what's going to happen down there? What's going to happen down there? You know, I'm going to take the shot and I'm going to fall out like Owen did. Oh, my God. <clears throat> worry builds hopelessness, as we said. And it's always about something. Well, if, if, if something's going to happen, or, or that's something that's going to go on over there, or that, that's something at work, those people at work are going to cause me trouble. There's always something that I see out there. My grandmother, speaking of granny, she always told me when I was uh, going to the University of Kentucky, she said, oh, son, I just get so concerned that something's going to happen to you up in that dorm where you're staying. I said, Granny, it's no problem up there. Well, well, honey, I've heard stories about elevators that stop about on the third floor and people can't get to the top. And somebody told me that they had a grandson over there at the University of Kentucky in the dorm where you're at, and the elevator got stuck. Oh, I'm so worried about you getting stuck in the elevator. Granny, I go up the stairs. That's the other dorm that you're thinking about. We ain't got no elevator. It's only three stories high. And she would look and start crying. Granny started crying, and I loved her heart. But you know what? Worry never has a plan. Worry just has doubt. I doubt that I'm going to make it. I doubt that I'm going to get through this addiction. I doubt that I'm going to get to the other side because I've been such a failure. I worry that I can't go into my future because it happened before. Don't you think it might happen again? You ever had any of those little doubtful statements? But here's what concern does. Concern, which I believe is godly, is starting today. Concern says, I have a plan. Let me give you this simple analogy. A kid out in the street. Let's say you have a house and the back door goes up to a road. And so you start saying, and you're a mama, I'm really worried that my kids could run out in the street. Oh, my God, what am I going to do? What do you, if I'm not here and a babysitter happens, what's going to happen? They're going to run out in the street. Oh, God. Concern would be, we live close to the street. Let's put a gate up so the children can't get out and that I have a lock that the babysitter only has the key. Concern would be the plan to bring it forth. Worry is the frustration over the big what if. You ever had concern over your children? Wah. What if they mess up again? What if they don't go forward? What if they get their heart broken? What if they get fired? What if they don't put any money away for retirement and they're always looking for me for more money? What if, what if, what if? You ever get held on to the what if? I like to take for every what if, but God. What if, but God. What if Owen had laid there for the, three, the third day, but God. God would have shown up, I'm sure, because his trust was not in whether the EMTs could come and get him. I love that statement. They said, what are you doing on the floor? <laughs> well, I'm just down here looking for marbles, you know. I just <laughs> wow. So, back to the screen. The fowls of the air, they sow not, neither they reap. They gather into barns. Your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much better from the lesser the birds to you. Look over it real quick at Matthew 10. We'll come right back, Jennifer, to that scripture. But look over at Matthew 10 just for a second. I love this. Matthew 10, verse 29. Now, he says here, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? A farthing in the Roman world was a tenth of a cent. And one of them shall fall on the ground, or, and, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father he understands it and knows that now look at the next verse the very hairs of your head are numbered no matter how few those hairs are or how many they might be <laughs> look i'm sorry for you ball guys you all shine for jesus we just said shine jesus shine that was for you do you ever think there's a part of you that you can hide from god not a thing. 
not an attitude, not a feeling. And let me give you even something greater. Not only can't hide it from him, he already knew it before you ever thought it. He already knew it before you ever felt it. He already knew it before you ever experienced it. He already knew it before you felt like a failure. He already had it. So why worry about it? He's already in your tomorrow. Wow. Because there's no time. Time is a created entity. He is outside of time. So why worry since he was in Owen's second and a half day? He was already in it. He already had the answer to it. So since he's my answer, why would I worry? Then let's go on to the next verse. Uh, I, I'm sorry. Let's, let's go back to um, Matthew 6. Let's go back to Matthew 6. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Let's go back to that. He says over in Luke that you can get five sparrows over on that side for the price of four. And yet even as cheap as a sparrow is to him, he says, I know every feather on that little body. Don't you think I know what you're going through? Sometimes we feel isolated. Sometimes we feel alone. Sometimes we feel as though nobody cares. Sometimes we feel there's no answer. All those things, ladies and gentlemen, emanate out of an untruth. And when I <clears throat> hold on those for any period of time, I don't know about you. My frustration starts to become aggravation. And then once I let frustration become aggravation, for me, I move into isolation. And a lot of people have done that. And when I say aggravation, I don't mean just a yelling and screaming. I mean, you've had frustration about the COVID issue, about the money, about the jobs, about what's going on. And, and that could be one of hundreds of topics in your life. You let frustration stay without giving it to the Lord. You start to get aggravation in your soul. And then either you blow up or you pull away in depression or go away. And the next thing you start to think is nobody cares. I'm alone. I have no support system. You can feel that way real quick, even if there's tons of people around you. And then <clears throat> you worry that you'll not make it to the next place of your life, the next step that God has for you. Can I tell you today it's a lie? It's not true. Let's go on now to verse 27. I'm going to move along here quickly. This next word I like to put on here, the la our last word was irrational. Now I'll say this is ineffective. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to your stature? A cubit is 18 inches. So I wouldn't personally want to add 18 inches to my 6'3". Sometimes in the past I'd like to lose 18 inches. But I want to tell you what, my worry can't add one thing to my stature. Get this. What you worry about today ruins your today. It sabotages your tomorrow. It steals your hope. It blocks your faith. And it has no vision in it. Wow. Wow. When I was up in the hospital years ago, I love to give you all my hospital stories. It's not because, oh, poor me, dear, did I do terrible? I had a heart attack. No. Yeah, but God did such awesome things when I was in the hospital. And I want to tell you what, I was worried. I've told you about Dr. McFarland before, our precious cardiologist right here in town. And I never told you part of what she said to me when she came in and spoke a prophecy over me. And it was long, and I won't go through all of it. But when she came in there, she found out I was part of a Spirit-filled church and that um, I was open to what the Lord would say through her. So she comes in and says, uh, I've heard about you from Mary Graham, because Mary works up there in cardiology on that uh, sixth floor. And she said, uh, Pastor, I, I have a prophetic word for you would that bother you if, if I gave it to you? No. Give it to me. I want it. And 
part of that, she said this, your worry about your chest pain and about your breathing is unsubstantiated. You're going to come through this just fine. And then she looked at me and she said, you know, I'm not just telling you that to make you feel better. And then she said this, she says, this isn't bedside manner. This is Holy Ghost talking. Oh, I loved it. Man, I loved it because I was worried. In that moment, I was scared I was going to have another heart attack. And so here comes a woman of God walking into that room, speaking the word to me, saying, let your worry go because that worry is actually stopping you, in essence, from the vision of your healing. And we'll talk about the gift of healing next Sunday a whole lot. So when I let worry or frustration or aggravation or isolation start to pull me in, I am sabotaging my faith because it's stolen the hope, which is my vision. So taking one cubit is ineffective. It's ineffective. Go on to the next verse, 28. And why take you thought for raiment or clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. I think of Jeannie Cooper always taught this. How they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. In other words, they don't sweat. They don't get into frustration. They don't get into a sense of, I've got to, I've got to, I've got to. What if, what if, what if? No, they simply go about being who they are. Next verse. And yet I say unto you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed as one of these. So here it is, the other eye. It's illogical. It's illogical to think that all the beauty of creation that he says is more beautiful than Solomon's temple, and everyone said that Solomon's temple was the greatest wonder of the world at that period of time. It was beautiful. Solomon was all about aesthetics. And so he wanted everything to look the best it did. So he says, that little flower that I've created is more beautiful. So if I think creation is that way, would I not think that he cares that way for me? So when I come to the end of the month and there's more months than money, would I not believe that God is not going to supply all my needs according to his riches and glory? Well, I want to tell you what. Uh, go on, let's, let's do verse 30, and that'll plug into this real good. Wherefore, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, in other words, that means the hotness of the summer burns it up, shall he not much more clothe you, look at the last part, O ye of little faith. What's the faith about? If I make my creation that beautiful, that special, that individual, would I not watch over and give you everything you need for life and godliness. That's why Second Peter, that chapter to me is so wonderful. He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. That all is big. He's given us all things when you're sick, all things when you're broke, all things when you're sad, all things when you're mistrusted. Somebody doesn't trust you and you don't trust them. All things when your children have messed up. All things when you have lost your job. All things. You have nothing to worry about, O oh, ye of little faith, because you see the problem as bigger than the promise. Next verse. Therefore, here's a Kenneth Hagin line right here. Therefore, take no thought saying. Wow. Wow. When Grandma took thought that I was going to get stuck on the elevator at the dorm at the University of Kentucky in Lexington, she said it to everybody. She said it to Mama. She said it to Daddy. She said to my brothers and sisters, he's going to get stuck up there. I heard it. And he got stuck and has had to stay in the elevator for like 12 hours. He, would he suffocate? I wish I'd gotten him a sandwich. Oh, God. You know what's going to happen? I love Granny's help. But you know what? <laughs> she said it to everybody. What's the point here? The point is, when I get a place on the inside of trepidation like I did in that hospital, when I get to that place of trepidation like I did when I saw my Lincoln Continental being towed in because I couldn't pay for it anymore years ago, 
and I watched for the first time in my life a car being repossessed out of my possession. I tell you what, I felt about this big because I couldn't make the payments anymore. And then what did I do? Isolate, pull back. And then in my isolation, I said, oh my God, I'm, I'm worried that I, that I won't have enough money to get through the next time. Where am I going to get any funds? What's going to happen? I'm broke. Oh God. And then all of a sudden, I start to realize that the problem has become bigger than the promise. And I start saying the promise instead of saying the problem. Now, does saying make it happen? No, but saying releases your faith in the answer while the problem is still there. That's called the Abrahamic faith. Call those things that be not as though they were. Now, is that denying a problem? No, that's speaking life into the problem. Wherefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Now, here's the letter I put on this, and that is illogical and identity. In other words, my identity is not a person that is not cared for by God in such a way that he is going to meet all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Next verse. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. You know what Gentiles were, folks, to the to the people in the Jewish world, they were heathen. Heathen in that they worshiped false gods. They worshiped pagan gods. And so he's saying right here, for these things the Gentiles do seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you have need of them. Well, the gods that they were worshiping didn't care, couldn't see, and didn't know. Didn't care, couldn't see, and didn't know. So what he's saying here is, you think your God is like that. Can't see, doesn't care, doesn't know. And he's saying, your heavenly Father, and I love the word knoweth here, it, it's in the Greek, it's gnosis. And it means to know it because you've experienced it. Owen knows a piano because he's experienced it for years and years and knows it intimately, knows the chords intimately, knows the scales intimately. He knows it and doesn't even have to look at it to realize what he's playing. When he says God knows, it means he's already into your experience of tomorrow, even if tomorrow is going to be really rough, even if tomorrow is going to be difficult. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what's going to happen in our country over the next few years, but can I tell you, it started with people who gave their worried concern to the Lord. September 1774, they had the first meeting that later in the summer of 1776 became the Declaration of Independence. That's when the Revolutionary War started. But in that year, get this, they pulled a group of people together. The folks from Georgia didn't know the people in Massachusetts. The ones in New York didn't know the ones in Virginia, but they all got together. 56 signers, of course, you know, is what they eventually had, but this wasn't that many. Here's what happened in that first group. John Adams was there, and he wrote his wife, Abigail. And he said, Abigail, we met for the first time decreeing, watch this, take no thought saying. They started to say, even though it was scary, Britain was tough. Britain was rough. Britain was hard. Britain had a navy and an army that had absolutely subdued most of the world. And you know what they had? Farmer Smith, Teacher Jones, Blacksmith Johnson with rifles over top of the fireplace. Let's pull it off and let's go be an army. And they, by the hand of God, defeated the British in 1880 or 1781. Well, here's what happened. That first meeting, September 1774, they got together, and guess what they did? They had a two-hour prayer meeting, and they read through five or four chapters of the Bible, most importantly being Psalms 35. Adams writes back to his wife and says, Please, dear, read Psalms 35, and I'm quoting this word, 
we had an anointed session where God taught all of us from Psalms 35, and it gave us the vision to then go ahead to defeat the British. That's how it started. Well, get this. From the year 1774 all the way up until 1815. Now, I exaggerate not. You can check my numbers. There were 1,400 congressional request for prayer, fasting, and humiliation. Oh, when I say humiliation, they were humiliating themselves. They were just saying they're getting down on their knees, and we're going to pray. 1,400 times Congress asked for prayer and fasting for this nation, all the way up till the time that the oldest signer of the Constitution, John Carroll, said, The mighty God has watched over us, protected us, taken fear from us because his hand has always been upon us. John Carroll died at, 19, in the, at the, the age of 93, and in 1826 he founded the city of Carrollton, Georgia. He was a man of God. Was there worry? Yes. Was there fear? Yes. Was there trepidation? Yes. And John Quincy Adams then came when he became president later in the 1800s. He came back and said, any, I'll read these down here, any man that does not believe that God was on the side of us against the British would have to be blind and not think that there is an almighty sovereign God. 1,400 times in their place of worry, they turned to the living God and began to pray. And those two-hour times in Congress, I wrote this down too, eight more times between 1774 and 1781, basically the end of the Revolutionary War, there were six more times when there were prayer meetings at least two hours in length, some of them four hours. This was the Congress of the United States. And for people to say that our country is not founded on godliness and godly truths is a lie. And the enemy is trying to steal it today. Well, I'm not going to get worried about it. But I'm going to stand and take no thought saying, I'm going to take the thought that the Lord gives us about this nation on this land and then worrying about whether it's going to fall apart. I'm going to speak what we may hear today at 4 o'clock. And that is the word that God has given us for our nation. I want to tell you guys, our own prophet here, Debbie Highland, has had some powerful words about our nation. And I've taken some of those and began to speak them. Because there's truth in them. So is Mary. Even out of our little congregation, there's been people in the midst of fear and worry and dread who said, take no thought saying. I'm going to start saying what God says. I'm going to start saying what John Adams said to his wife. I'm going to start saying what, oh, get this. Here's another one. John Hancock, the big signature that's on the Declaration of Independence. He was the governor of Massachusetts at that time. John Hancock, in one four-year period, get this, had 22 times he called the people of Massachusetts in a public document to have a day or two of prayer and fasting. Can you imagine today a governor saying that? Much less the governor of Massachusetts, who would say 22 times in four years, we're going to have prayer. And then watch this, y'all. Talking about breaking worry and breaking fear and breaking dread that was all over this land back then. Watch this. Then after each prayer time, Hancock comes back and says, now we have a proclamation to give thanks for what God has done. See, the thanksgiving that came from Washington in 1789 and later was then brought back by Lincoln in 1864, our thanksgiving that we have now on that uh, Thursday in, in November, all came out of these little thanksgivings. They had all these times of saying, we're worried, we're scared, but God, we're going to take no thought to that. We're not going to deny it. We're not going to get into worry. We're going to have concern. And what's going to be the basis of our concern? Prayer, intercession, giving of thanks. That's what our nation was built on, ladies and gentlemen. And that's why we don't have to worry. We don't have to get into dread. We don't have to get under it. Yes, we want to have wisdom in this hour. i got to shut up. All right. I, I, I love what our founders did. Isn't it awful that they're trying to deny our founders? They want to take down the founders. I want to tell you, we weren't started in the 1619 project. We were started in the 1776 project. 
And that project was to say a nation where every person had inalienable rights. And all of it was birthed by the Word of God. Last little bit. Next verse. Then we've got to go eat. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. Let me put a little thing on here as we close. What's this mean? I could look at this verse under the Old Covenant, or I could look at it under the New Covenant. Under the Old Covenant, remember, Jesus hadn't gone to the cross yet. This is what I call a transition, right in between. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Does this mean that by seeking the kingdom of God, that that gives me a reward of the things of the kingdom? In other words, oh, if I seek hard enough, if I look hard enough, if I believe hard enough, then as a reward I will receive the benefits of the kingdom. That would be the way it would seem, and that would be an old covenant way. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be added unto you. Well, I want to tell you what. That's not true. The kingdom's already here. So now it's not me seeking to hope that my performance will earn it. Now it's me saying, it's already done. Everything that you can receive to break the hold of dread, fear, worry, and uh, depression has already been provided. How is it provided? I know you get tired of hearing it here, but I'm going to say it again. It's by the great and precious promises. The promises already given, already paid for by Jesus, already given to you, and all you have to do is receive them by faith. That's the kingdom. Thy kingdom come. Really, in the Lord's Prayer, it's already come. How? In the person of Jesus. Who's the envoy of it? The Holy Spirit. So his kingdom has come. So now when I seek the kingdom, it's not that i got to search to get it. It's already here, and I just, my seeking is to go and take it. So if this is my old beat-up cell phone, I don't know why I use this for so many different sermon illustrations. It needs healing bad. Uh, looking on the phone, here's our missionary from Pakistan right on here. Look at this. You want to see a good word? Speaking a good word to a guy who lives in total chaos all the time, doesn't worry about it, doesn't let it pull him down. He says to me today, Happy Fourth of July, Pastor. You're a blessing to us. Hope we're a blessing to you. God is real. We'll never give up. The Lord is on our side. We shall not fear. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. If you're watching today from Pakistan, I love you. Thank you for your example of boldness and not letting worry and fear steal from your ministry ever again. Wow. So in my analogy, I could say I'm seeking for the phone. It would be hidden somewhere. I wonder where my phone is. Anybody ever had that? I wonder where my phone is. Owen was wondering where his phone was. <laughs> so the old covenant thing would be I better find it. Better find it. God, am I doing a good job to try to find it? Did I pray right? Did I talk right? Did I confess right? Did I work right? Did I tithe right? Did I come to church right? Did I love people right? Did I witness right? Yes, son, it's underneath the papers on your pulpit. Oh, thank you, God. That'd be an old covenant style. Here's new covenant. Son, it's already right there. I've given you everything you need on that phone. Take it. Here's your number. I've paid the bill already. Just go ahead and dial H-E-A-V-E-N. It's already in you. You already have all. So what are you worried about? Why are you concerned? Why are you under it? Why are you depressed? The Lord is on my side. I don't have to fear. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be provided unto you God didn't say I am that I was I am that I will be he says I am that I am now 
Why steal your now worrying about tomorrow? Or bit out of shape because of yesterday? We've got this one day, like Gerald said. We've got this day, July 4th. Rather than being all upset about what may happen tomorrow, I want to live today, enjoy fellowship with you all in our new fellowship hall today. I want to enjoy the body of Christ. I want to enjoy relationships. My worry, my fear, and my dread will stop that. But aren't you glad <laughs> those things are over? I saw a sign years ago, y'all, I remember this, out in Oklahoma. It said, and this guy was just playing a joke. He said, free gas tomorrow. <laughs> Next day you go up, free gas tomorrow. Free gas tomorrow. Whoa. You know what? I have free blessings today. I have free blessings today. Heard about the guy who said he only worried on Wednesdays from 12 to 3. Rest of the week he didn't worry. He put all his worries written down on a little piece of paper in a box. He'd only look at them from 12 to 3 on Wednesday. After a period of time, he opened up the box and realized that God had already provided the answer and he didn't have to worry anymore. The Lord is on your side. Cast your burden upon the Lord. He shall sustain you. He shall never suffer your righteous feet to be moved. <laughs> be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with, anybody know? Thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to I'm going to leave you seven words. Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. Bow your head. Father, I love you, Lord Jesus. Right now in this place, I cast all my worries on you. Every one of them that have assailed me, every one of them where I can't seem to get an answer, Every time when I felt bankrupt on the inside, every situation, Father, that I can't control, I give it to you right now in this moment, on this Sunday morning, July 4th, 2021. Lord, you told us to cast, and that word means to cast so far out that you can't go get it again. So, Lord, I today cast my care, and I confess and I speak out today, Deuteronomy 33, 25, As your days are, so shall your strength be. The eternal God is my refuge, and underneath me are his everlasting arms. I claim that, Father. All financial worries I give to you in the name of Jesus. Father, every financial worry we may ever have in this church, in our outreach, I thank you for it, God. I'm not going to worry about it anymore. Because I realize you love me more than birds, more than lilies. You love me, Lord God, so much that you created in all of us the ability to hear you, to be blessed by you, and to receive from you all we need for life and godliness. I give you my relational concerns, Father. Every one of those where we've worried, Relations at home, relation with kids, relation with grandkids, relationship with loved ones. I take all those concerns, and I give them to you right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, health concerns. Some of us today got a lot of pains in a lot of different places, a lot of different challenges, and we don't know how to fix them. So, Lord God, I right now cast the worry and concern of physical situations on you. I trust you. I believe in you. I have received from you. And right now, Lord God, I just absolutely take what the old hymn says. I surrender all. I surrender all. All my worries of health. All my worries of family. All my worries of finances. All my worries about every situation at work, Lord God. All of the things that we have that assail us on the job, I give them to you. I'm not going to worry about anything. I'm going to pray about everything. I thank you, Lord God. Lord Jesus, if there's one person in this room today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, they've been trying to take the load themselves. And we are not burden-bearing people. We are meant to give our burden to the Lord. 
So, Father, if they're carrying an undue burden today and they don't know you as Lord and Savior, or maybe kind of like Owen said, he said, I believe in Jesus, but I don't believe he's my Lord. I don't believe he's my life. Then, Lord, today I'm believing that those folks will, as Owen said, get truly saved today, not because they improve themselves, but because they allow you to prove in them how much you love them. If there's anybody in that place, in this place today before we go eat lunch and you're unsure, please, please, I adjure you, lift your hand and let us pray a salvation prayer with you today so you, like our brother, can have the assurance and then you're not going to have to worry another day. Anybody in here today? Anybody? All right, I trust that everybody is saved in this place. Look up at me and say amen three times. Amen, amen, and amen. All right. Um, is anybody today not able to stay and eat lunch with us? Uh, if, if you can't, if you got to go, we understand. Um, we're going to dismiss you first. Anybody that's, that's headed out today, they can't stay with us. God bless you. We love you. And uh, so if you all have to go, we have food for you. But if you got to go, you know. Everybody else stay seated just a minute. All these people are living a fasted life. Okay, all of you that can't stay, you all can go ahead and go. Okay. Now the rest of us, we're going to pray a blessing and we're going to go eat. Would you all do one little thing with me? Would you just turn towards that building and stretch your hand out to it? And we're just going to dedicate that building. Father, thank you for this fellowship hall. Thank you, Father. We had a lot of worries about it, but it has come to pass. We bless every fellowship meeting we have in here. We bless every person that goes into that building. I just thank you for the peace of God, the joy of the Lord, the grace of God. And I thank you for the love of God to be in operation. I bless the physical part of this building. Father, we are believing our electricity will work right. Our plumbing will work right. We're believing there won't be any problems with any construction part of this building. It is committed to you. It is dedicated to you. We thank you for it. And we today say, Lord God, you will lead us in everything we do in this building. Every meeting, every teaching, every preaching, every bit of counseling. Every person we give food to, Father, they'll be blessed as they come in and out of this building. We commit it to you and dedicate it to you today. In the name of Jesus, everybody said amen. amen. All right. Let's go ahead and take um, uh, all you folks that are in the back one, two, three rows uh, from Joanna on up to um, Josh and Sarah and all that. Why don't you all go ahead and just get in line over there and go right ahead. It won't take but a minute. Chow down. Have a good time. <laughs> Just remember over here, the last shall be first. Greg will guide you. Yeah, they'll serve you over there. They'll serve you. <laughs> He's down in Dothan, seeing his family. Yeah. The tree that's planted by the water is Keep that down just a little bit, guys. Fire.